And the other thing about the Revised Common Lectionary, or RCL, is with three years, you get a year of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, a year of Mark, and a year of Luke. And then the Gospel of John is just kind of sprinkled in all throughout. Well, here at New Heights, we follow a different lectionary called the Narrative Lectionary. And the Narrative Lectionary takes us through the Bible in four years. And so each of the Gospels has their own year, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the really important thing that the narrative lectionary does is it's trying to tell the story of the Bible. That's why it's a narrative lectionary. And so each year you start in the beginning and we go to the end. And the idea is that we're, we're reading through and watching as the story of what God's doing is unfolding. We kind of follow it chronologically, the story of how God is loving, blessing, and saving the world, the story of salvation. It unfolds from beginning to end. And so the idea is that Um, From one week to the next, the story continues. So we're always connecting where we were to where we are and where we're going. And so there's a flow to the whole thing. And my hope is that for you, that helps us all to better understand how the Bible, the story of the Bible unfolds. And so um, every year, again, like I said, we start back at the beginning. But then what we do is um, we hear different parts of the key characters each year. So, you know, usually every year we'll, we'll hear about Abraham and Moses uh, in the Old Testament. But we won't hear the whole Abraham story and the whole Moses story. We'll hear parts of it and different parts each year. So anyway, you'll see as this all unfolds. But all that to say, we're starting back in the beginning Kicking off this year of the narrative lectionary, and so we're in Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of the Bible. And of course, uh, the beginning of the Bible is about creation. And, and so I want to say a few things about Genesis, in particular the creation stories in Genesis. And if you don't know that, there's actually two creation stories in the beginning of the Bible, in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And chapter one we're going to be looking at today is the story that we're all familiar with, where God speaks, let there be light. And what happens? Boom, there's light. And so it's very much God speaking and creation happening. When you read the second creation story, we get to see God like a, kind of like a potter molding clay. God's down in the dirt using God's hands, molding and shaping and breathing life. And so that story of God making Adam and breathing into him, that's in that second creation story. Well, all throughout, uh, especially those first chapters in Genesis, I, I wanna understand, want you to understand a couple of important things. The Israelites, when they told these stories, um, they, didn't, they didn't tell them in, in order to tell us like we might read a factual newspaper article today where a factual newspaper article is giving you all the facts, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those stories in Genesis were meant to help us understand who God is, how God's at work in the world, and what our relationship is with God. That's their primary goal in, these, in the creation story and what we read here in the first chapters of Genesis. So the writers aren't wanting you to debate with someone whether there was actually really seven days of creation or not. They're not wanting you to debate whether actually it happened exactly this way. That's, that's really not the point. God could have done it that way. There's no reason why God couldn't have. But it, but it doesn't mean it had to be that way. So what we want to understand here is what, how God is working and what God's motives are and how that helps us understand who we are in relationship to God. Okay? So some of that conversation might be brand new to you, but we're going to wade in and see what happens here. And what I love about this first chapter of Genesis, this creation story, is that we see a God who is all-powerful, who's creative, whose who's primary objective is to create, is to make life, create beautiful things and make life. And we see a God who's creating this world, and as God creates, God says, this is good. It's a God who enjoys his creation, who's excited about his creation. And I want to invite you today to be thinking about how awesome God's creation is and how, how beautiful this world is that God made. And then in the midst of that, we're thinking about our role in all of this. What a gift that God has given us this world. What a gift that we get to explore this world and enjoy it and take it in. And also there's a role for us in taking care of this creation and stewarding this gift God's given us. So we're going to be thinking about those pieces uh, as, as we dive into this today. And I hope that bottom line, you'll walk away feeling like, wow, you know, we have an awesome God. Who, who does awesome things, and God asks me to be a part of that. That's pretty exciting. So um, let's start at the beginning. We're, we're going to read day one, 
And then we're going to talk about the other days, and then we'll read day six. So we won't read all of them, but let's start with day one, Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Now do you hear, as this story unfolds, do you hear kind of the rhythm in here? And do you hear... uh, there's this sense of, okay, there's this, there's this formless, empty, chaotic void, and God's spirit hovers over it, and God speaks, and things happen, and from the chaos starts to emerge something beautiful. And this creation story was especially powerful for the Israelites uh, as they were facing cha- a, 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 the chaotic world that they lived in. And for many of us, um, for those of us who remember 9-11, as we remember 20 years ago, we remember how chaotic that day was when we were all trying to figure out what was going on in the world. And of course, we all, under, we all relate to how chaotic life can be sometimes. In the midst of the chaos in our lives and all that's happening, it's good to know that we have a God who brings order out of the chaos, a God who enters into the chaos in life and brings order to it. And then, as we're going to read, creates life and breathes life into all of that chaos. And so we hear this incredible order. And so let me tell you a couple of things that happen. So we'll break down the first few, the days of creation. So the way this reading unfolds, the first three days of creation, God is busy taking this chaotic, formless thing and, and separating things out to bring order. And then in the second three days, he's going back to those places and bringing life into that emptiness, bringing life. So let's see how that unfolds. So in day one, God is separating the light from the darkness. Okay, now when we get to day four, God's coming back to that area and God's going to put the sun and the moon and the stars into that arena. Then we see the same thing happen with day two and day five and then day three and day six. So there's this parallelism that happens. So in day two, God is separating out uh, the waters. And so God creates the sky and the waters below and gives us this space in between, this dome in between. And so what happens in day five, that day that parallels, God puts the birds in the air and the fish and the sea creatures in the waters. Okay? Then we get to day three and day six. On day three, God separates the water from the dry land. And then on day six, on the dry land, what does God do? Well, God puts all the animals, all the creatures, and finally, ultimately, human beings. So there's this really cool flow to how all this happens. But also, there's another um, important part of, of the flow here that's interesting to note, the order to this all. And each day, there's a pattern that follows. And so we get the, the beginning of the creation we read, and God said. And then there's this command where God says, let there be, and what happens? Boom, there it is. Let there be light, and there's light. Let there uh, there be uh, dry land, and boom, there's dry land. God speaks, and it happens. And then what we read is, the result is God says, let there be, and then then the pattern is, is, it was so. It was so. It happens. Then we get this evaluation. Each day as God creates, God stops and looks at what God's done. And God says, it's good. It's good. And then finally, that day is wrapped up with the continual refrain. And there was morning. And there was evening. And there was the whatever day it is, right? So we get this nice flow as you go along. But here's what's interesting. Day six is unique out of all the days. And day six, it follows the same pattern, except there's some tweaks to it. And it's meant to help us all recognize that there's something really special about day six. The culmination, the climax of creation is happening. God's crowning achievement, finally, God is going to make humankind. And so what we'll notice, we're going to read day six here in a moment. What we'll notice is, instead of God saying, let there be, God says, let us make. And right, this, this moves us into that idea of the second Genesis story where God's down in the dirt making the human beings out of the clay. So God doesn't just say, let there be. God says, let us make. And he says, let us make human beings in our image. 
So we're going to talk about what that means to be made in the image of God in just a moment. But also then, when we get to the result part, the it was so part, this is expanded dramatically and we get this section of poetry in which God is offering a blessing. And God is saying to us humans, this is what you are to do. Be fruitful and multiply. I'm giving you this earth to, for you to reign over. And we're going to talk about what that means to be, be asked to be caretakers or stewards of God's earth. And then finally, the last thing that's different and special about day six Instead of saying it was good, what does God say? It was very good. It's really important to note that God, as God's busy creating, God is enjoying what God's doing. And at the end of day six, God looks at all of it. God's just made humans. And God says, it's very good. It's very good. And you need to hear that today, my friends, that when God looks at God's creation, God, God is an artist who, who enjoys what he's made. And when he looks at us in particular, he says, you're my masterpiece. You're my crowning achievement. You're my work of art. It's very good. It is very good. And I want you to be thinking about that today as we think about our role in this life and how we relate to God. God looks at us and says, it's very good. So let's, um, let's go ahead and read day six. And, and then we're gonna um, kind of, we'll actually we'll read six and seven and then we'll talk about it. So, In verse 26, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And then God said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made And he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. So he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. So we have day six and day seven and a number of important things for us to note here. The first one is that God makes us in God's image. Now there's lots of, I think, theological conversation about what that exactly means to be made in God's image. Does it mean that we look like God? Does it mean that because um, of our, the way we think that we're, we're able to think in a way that's closer to God? Or is it because we have a soul or a spirit like God? What is it that makes us in God's image? What's that all about? And I think all of those things are possibilities. But bottom line, I think what it means is that um, God made us to uh, do the thing, the kinds of things that God does. And what do we read here that God does? God creates. God gives life. God looks at God's creation and says, it is good. And we, what we're reminded of here is God intends for us to carry on the work that God has done here. And as we talk here in a moment about the blessing that God gives them, it's all about God inviting you and I to be a part of what God's doing in, in the world to be co-creators with God, to be people who give life. So I want you to be thinking about the ways that you co-create with God, the ways that you give life. And we're going to talk about what that means. Now, um, I think what's powerful then when we hear this blessing is is thinking of it in that way. Uh, God says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and govern it, and reign over the fish in the sea, and so on. Now, we have, to under, we have to think about what does this really mean? What does it mean to reign over? Because we can take that in lots of different ways, can't we? We, we, we know the idea of a dictator who reigns supreme, who just commands things to happen and, and doesn't really care about the well-being of others, right? Versus the kind of king we see in Jesus. 
the kind of king who Jesus' way of reigning is giving his life away. And we're reminded that this invitation from God is about us caretaking what God has given us. That we're, we're invited to steward this creation of God, to enjoy it as God does, but to be a part of, of co-creating within it. So I wonder, what are some of those ways that we co-create with God? Do you have any thoughts about that? How, how are ways that we co-create? How are ways that we give life? There's some literal ways of that and, and maybe some figurative ways of that. Does anybody have any thoughts? Jake? Okay, first of all, the way that we love, when we share God's love, we are giving life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Yona? So Leon is thinking of the Brookside Gardens in Mazamania and the idea that there's this intentional growing of vegetables that then are available for others, especially for those who don't have them, right? So a literal creating life, helping to grow life, to share, to give, right? And, uh, and to take that a step further, you know, we think of our, our food pantries, our literal way that we are giving life. Absolutely, absolutely. Can you think of other ways that we are co-creators and ways that we're giving life? Tricia? Yeah. Yeah, Trisha lifted up the ways that we give life in this place and our welcoming. Um, she said, you know, I see when people are guests here and, they, and then they post on social media about the way they found they were given life in this place, the way that we greet people, the way that we love them. We give life as we do that. Absolutely. Now, I'll take that a step further too. Uh, when I go into Quick Trip and I purchase something and I look at that cashier and where they're just going through the things that they're supposed to say every time. And I look them in the eye and I say, thank you so much. And you can tell it catches them off guard because they don't very often get somebody who intentionally looks at them and says, thank you so much. It means something. And, and that could be anywhere we go, right? The way that we just simply look someone in the eyes and take a moment to acknowledge their existence and let them know that we appreciate them. It's simple, but it can make a big difference. Anna, was your hand up? Beautifully said. Bringing that in and allowing it, like you said, going into Quick Trip, you know, every person who passed in the grocery store, allowing God's presence to reign. Hmm. So you said something, I, maybe, hopefully I can still capture it. Uh, Anna said a beautiful thing around how we have, first of all, we have a mission. And that's really what this blessing that God is offering to, to Adam and Eve here is it's this mission of here's what your life is to be about. And as humans, we're great at getting busy about all sorts of things, and we forget that we have a pretty simple mission, really. And the, what Anna said, I think, was that we get to create space for God to be present. All right? Part of co-creating with God is just simply creating space for God to show up. And so we do that in the ways that we welcome people, in the way that we love them, in the way that we're present with them. We create space for God's presence and love to be made known. And we can do that anywhere. We can do that in our school. We can do that in our workplace. We can do that in our neighborhood. We can do that in any, any store that we're in. We can create space for God to show up. And that is a really beautiful thing, isn't it? A really beautiful thing. Now here, uh, as Andy announced earlier, we're getting ready to start God's Work Our Hands. And uh, in lots of places, it's a one-day event that happens on September 12th. Uh, for us, that's Wild West Days in Mazo, and it's a terrible day for us to try to do a church-wide event. And so either we move it to a different date or we just spread it out over lots of days. And so this year, we're spreading that out. But God's Work Our Hands is all about carrying out the mission God's given us to be people who are giving life to the community. And those projects that we do are sometimes for local people and sometimes they're projects that are going, um, you know, school bags that might go for kids around the country or even internationally. Quilts that go internationally, giving life to people in other places. Simple and yet really important, magical things that we do. Um, let's also not miss, as we talk about um, 
being co-creators with God is the ways that we are called to caretake this earth. For some of us, that might mean actually being involved in particular projects that have to do with water conservation or other kinds of things that we might do to take care of the resources that God's given us. I think for all of us, though, it's a reminder for us to step outside and look around and appreciate the beauty of God's creation. And for me, this transitions into day seven. We read that God, after God had finished creating, uh, God looked at what God had done and rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. I think there's a couple things I want you to hold on to as we move towards the um, wrapping this up. We are so good at being busy and we are often not so good at just stopping and appreciating and taking it all in. And so here God has put all of this love and energy and effort into creating this beautiful creation and God doesn't just jump to the next thing. God steps back and goes, yeah, this is good, very good, and then rests and appreciates and enjoys. It's important for us, my friends, to take some time to stop and go, yeah, this is good, this is very good. This world is a beautiful place, and this life that God has given me is a beautiful life. And even with all the struggles and chaos and things that we face, it is good. God has given us so much good things. But if we don't stop to rest and appreciate, we just run ourselves into the ground, don't we? And so we're reminded that a healthy way of living is to be busy with the things that God gives us to do to create life, but then to step back and rest and appreciate where God's at in that mix and all that God's done and say, it is very good. It's very good. Annalyn? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Anna said, imagine if, if, you know, all across the world, they took this idea seriously. And of course, uh, for me, I remember back to those, you know, those months after the initial lockdown with COVID. Remember all the stories about like animals, like moving back in closer to the cities and how, um, you know, pollution was changing and animal movements were changing. It was a really interesting thing, right? And um, we're reminded that we all need this rhythm of rest. We need this rhythm. Well, bottom line, though, uh, what I want you to hear today is you are made in God's image, and, and God looks at you and says it's very good. And part of being made in God's image means that you're invited to join with God in God's mission to love and bless and save the world, to bring God's kingdom to life. And we do that as co-creators, giving life, creating beauty, creating space, as Anna said, for, God's, for God to be made known, for God to be present. This is the mission of the church, my friends. I mean, part of, part of being church is that we get to gather together to worship and fellowship and encourage one another. But the other really important part of being church is that we're sent on a mission each day to create space for God to show up, for others to come to know who Jesus is, to know God's love. We get to join with God in that mission, and that's pretty cool. Let's pray. Awesome, God. We're reminded today that you are mighty. You are awesome. You are a God who creates, who gives life, a God who creates in love. And you invite us into relationship with you in love. And you look at us and you say that we are very good. And you invite us to join with you in sharing that same love with the world. And so God, we ask that you help us. Help us, first of all, to appreciate each day all you've given us. Help us to look at the life we have and say it is good it is very good and help us lord to look for those opportunities to make space for you help us to look for those opportunities lord to um, to create space for your presence and your love to be made known god we thank you that you are a god who comes into our chaos and brings order who comes into our brokenness and brings life a god who takes the formless and void and empty and creates something beautiful May we join with you in creating beauty in this world, creating life, inviting others to know you more deeply. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
And so, my friends, as we move into our time of Holy Communion, I invite you to get your home or your communion kits here in the room ready. You can start peeling back those layers, the top layers holding in the wafer and the second layers holding in the grape juice. For those of you at home, find whatever you have. If you've got sandwich bread, if you've got a bagel or donuts, crackers, whatever you have would be great for a drink. I've got apple juice. Maybe you've got milk or coffee or orange juice or water. Whatever you have, pull that out this morning. What we're celebrating in this meal is what our Lord Jesus does to create new life in us and in this world. See, God's creation isn't just about making things, it's also about making things new. And when we celebrate communion, we're celebrating that each day Jesus comes to us and makes us new. As we invite him in, Jesus makes us new, takes our brokenness, our sin, forgives us, and makes us new all over again. And in this meal, we're remembering that that is offered to us each and every day. So let's take this time together to remember that God makes us new. We remember today that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it. He offered it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord took the cup. He blessed it. He offered it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed 